So today's seminar is Earthquakes and Tsunamis Caused by Low Angle Normal Faulting in the Bunda Sea, Indonesia, by Dr. Phil Cummins. So I'll just uh, for those who don't know Phil, I will give you a bit of a background on him uh, before we introduce him and hand him over for this session. So Phil received his PhD in Geophysics from University of California, Berkeley in 1988 and subsequently worked in a range of postdoctoral and research fellow roles at ANU University until 1996, where he moved to the Japan Center for Marine and Earth Science Technology, uh, leading their geodynamics research. Until 2001, where he took up a position at Geoscience Australia, leading our earthquake and tsunami hazard research. Uh, then in 2011, he accepted a joint appointment between GA and ANU, where he is a professor of natural hazards, where he's able to combine his teaching and research in natural hazards with the technical application of the science at Geoscience Australia. Now, as it relates to this particular uh, presentation, Phil has worked for over 15 years in earthquake and tsunami in uh, Indonesia, both in his role at Geoscience Australia and also in his professorship at ANU. Along with colleagues from GA and a range of uh, government agencies in Indonesia, he was a key member of a team that developed the first comprehensive national earthquake hazard map for Indonesia. He's worked closely with the Bundong Institute of Technology uh, and recently he was awarded the Ganesha Wadia Jasa Uriyatama Award for his contribution to research and education Education and holds an honorary professorship at that institution. So I think with that background, we are well, we are in good hands and, and Phil is well placed to sort of take us through his research. Um, so for though just a bit of housekeeping, please put any questions you have into the chat area. Uh, other than that, I will please join me in welcoming Phil to the virtual stage. Phil, over to you. Thanks very much for that introduction, Margie. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about this work, which uh, we were very uh, uh, lucky, or I think we were fortunate to be able to publish this in Nature Geoscience uh, a few months ago. It grew out of uh, my student, Riam Pranancho's thesis. He was working on historical tsunamis in Eastern Indonesia, but it was really neat that we were able to combine this with some remarkable work that Jonathan Pownell did, as well as work that Jonathan Griffin had done, who we you know, our, our, our own uh, colleague from who's now in New Zealand, as well as a PhD student, Xi and Zhao at ANU. I'm not going to give an uh, outline. I'm just going to start off with this slide to discuss um, submarine uh, bathymetry and uh, and uh, want to point out the um, that uh, we all know, I think, that that uh, one of the most remarkable features of the Earth's uh, bathymetry is these submarine trenches, these very deep submarine trenches. Uh, overall, the, the uh, ocean basins have a depth of roughly uh, uh, 3,000 meters, but in some of these trenches, it can get much, much deeper. It can go uh, you know, up to 10,000 meters deep in the Mariana Deep, but other trenches can be up to you know, anywhere from, say, six to 9,000 um, meters deep. And, and we all know that these marine trenches are associated with subduction zones, where ocean, oceanic uh, lithosphere uh, dives beneath uh, uh, often either continental or island arc lithosphere and it's the scene of some of the most intensive tectonic activity on the planet uh, we that we develop but that, that's where uh, volcanic arcs are developed uh, often we get uh, high mountain ranges that get uh, developed due to the uh, strong compressive forces and uh, and of course there are very large earthquakes there the plate boundary here uh, uh, is called a megathrust, and uh, it is responsible for generating the large, by far the largest earthquakes we have on the planet, and those also generate large and sometimes destructive tsunamis. So these marine trenches are associated with very intense tectonic, tectonic activity, which in turn uh, are uh, set the scene for very large uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. There's just one, uh, uh, one uh, very deep uh, marine feature on this map, which is not associated directly with the marine trench. And in fact, it's the only one on the globe uh, deeper than 7,000 meters, which is not directly associated with a marine trench. And that is this one. This is called the Weber D. And as we'll see, this is not, it might look on the surface like a marine trench, but it's it's much broader and it's actually not located where the megathrust um, reaches the Earth's surface, as is the case for the other subduction zone. So it really is quite a mysterious feature, and, and it's observable on a global scale. So just as with the 
the um, subduction zones, you know, we can see that bathymetry and we can infer that it's a scene of intense tectonic activity. We might do the same thing here. We see this remarkable feature in the bathymetry and surely this reflects uh, uh, some dramatic dynamic process. Uh, but the question is, what is it? Um, now, the Bondesi is associated with subduction. It's often drawn, uh, the, the plate boundaries in the Bondesi are often drawn in this form where you see this remarkable uh, subduction zone that appears to wrap uh, around on itself with a radius of curvature that I think is about 300 kilometers. It's a very tight curve. I think it's the tightest of any subduction zone in, in the world. Um, and uh, and this has been uh, always thought to be this to be likely to be uh, responsible for a considerable earthquake and tsunami hazard. Uh, I think that's all I needed to say about this. This is uh, I do want to set the scene here. Look at the inset, just so that you're, you may not be aware that uh, this is eastern Indonesia. So here's eastern. Uh, this, here's Indonesia. This is the eastern part of Indonesia. This is the Australian plate. So Australia's down here and it's moving northward and resulting in a lot of collision and, and some strike slip uh, faulting in the, in this region. And then, but then the Bonda Sea is this area right in here, which is surrounded by this remarkable circular apparent subduction zone. Um, now this has been explained uh, traditionally, not by a single subduction zone that wraps around, but really by two faults. This seemed to be the most likely explanation, at least uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, this was, uh, I think it was originally Cardwell and Isaacs who proposed this. You can see down here, this is the Bond to Sea, and here's the Australian plate subducting, and it somehow gets sort of warped around like this, but there's a separate plate subducting up here. It's subducting in the southward direction beneath Serum. And so you had one plate, you had the Australian plate subducting northward, so this is the Serum plate subducting southward. And this was given a little bit more detail in a paper by McCaffrey in 1989, where you can see, again, here's the Bond to Sea, here's the, here's the arc, and these are some cross sections. Let's see, N7 here, N8, and N9. And if you look at this, you see the, um, let's see, that's actually Serum, so that's the southward dipping slab, and then the northward dipping slab south north so there's the idea is that there were two slabs that were sort of dipping together northward and southward and that's how you get that um that tight curvature it's not really curving around and then they're joined by the suture here which which is drawn this is a very well-known uh strike slip fault the the tarera iduna uh left lateral strike slip fault here and basically um this was drawn to connect these two subduction zones um and I'll just say, I think I'll say in this slide that, that um, you know, once more detailed geological studies were done, there, there isn't that much evidence for this model. There isn't a lot of evidence, for example, for the consumption of ocean lithosphere. There's not, not any remnant. You, you expect normally uh, a subduction zone, if subduction has been occurring for some time, that there would be remnants of the ocean lithosphere that gets subducted there. And there really isn't much here. Uh, and nor is there really evidence, as I understand it, for this suture. This should be a major suture, but really there is this Tarera ter Iduna fault here, which, you know, which sort of peters out. I mean, we don't, I don't like to have major faults petering out, but basically the seismicity and the signature of that fault just sort of ends as it goes offshore. So this is a bit speculative, this connection here between these two supposed subducting slabs. As, as far as I'm aware, that that is quite speculative, although it shows up in, uh, in, global plate models. This is the model of Peter Bird. I should have referenced this here, 2003. So you can see again, Bond to C, and you can see that he, he's uh, drawn the subduction beneath Serum here, and you can see there's lots of uh, uh, things happening in here as you go from this southward dipping slab to what is no longer really subduction. It's a combination of ocean, ocean convergent and continental convergent boundary here. So Peter Bird has clearly been um, pretty unsure about exactly what type of tectonic plate boundary this is. But in any case, he's drawn, this is what we typically see when we see the plate boundaries drawn in the Bond to Sea. And I, with this, I, I've plotted um, earthquakes on here. Any seismologist knows uh, about Bond to Sea earthquakes there. It's a very active source of earthquakes. Um, it, it's really uh, interesting that they're very, tend to have very clean waveforms because most of the earthquakes, most of the large, the vast majority of the large earthquakes occur at considerable depth, greater than 50 and, and 100 degree, uh, 100 kilometers. So they result in very clean, crisp waveforms, which are really good for structural studies. 
Um, this is also uh, remarkable. Bondesi earthquakes are also remarkable because they're often felt in Australia. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you listen to this for just a couple of minutes. Okay, that's a pretty, I like that guy. I wanted to get the guy's quote, but I uh, thought that's a good place to end it. Jonathan Bathgate does appear in that news news uh, uh, broadcast, though. Uh, if I'd let it run a little bit farther, we would have seen him. Um, uh, this was for uh, an earthquake, um, I think, in 2006, magnitude 7.2 in 2006. Uh, the one on the right here is another earthquake, magnitude 7.5, uh, just last year. So I've asserted here with with very little evidence that the Banda Sea is probably the most consistent source of earthquake shaking felt by Australians. Because you really, if you just Google this, you'll find that in fact, in Darwin and elsewhere in the Northern Territory, these earthquakes are often felt. Oh, sorry. Um, but the remarkable thing is they are often felt in Australia, but not so much in Indonesia. So this here I've plotted in Google Earth, the. Um, the uh, felt intensities from Did You Feel It for that same 2019 earthquake. So it's a little bit complicated here. The earthquake was right here. It was at about, it was reasonably deep. I can't remember. I think it was two to 300, maybe 200 kilometers depth. Um, and uh, you can see here, these are the intensity measurements. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that the, the intensity felt in Darwin uh, were, were just as strong as those felt in the Eastern Banda Sea and in Dili. And even in Catherine, the, there were still weak intensities that was similar to some of the um, intensities felt in Indonesia. And even all the way to Cairns, you, there were a few observations of light shaking. And those were similar to what was felt in Kupang, even though the distance was three times greater. So it's really remarkable, and any Australian seismologist will know this, it's really remarkable uh, that the, uh, the earthquake uh, shaking can be felt so far into Australia. And we all know this is almost certainly due to the fact that it's very, the Australian lithosphere is very old and, and has very low attenuation. So it's very efficient at allow, at transmitting seismic wave energy. And I've shown on here a figure uh, uh, that Trevor Allen sent us, sent a, a number of us by email. He's been looking at this because it's, you know, of some concern for uh, earthquake hazard in Australia. And here he's shown a couple of these Bondesi earthquakes. In fact, it's this one, and one, it's this one in 2019 and one in 1995 that were recorded in the Northern Territory. This is the ground motion, the acceleration as a fraction of uh, G, and this is the period. So these short periods are the ones that people, people typically feel. This is one second period. 0.1 seconds. So that's the kind of range that people typically feel. And that could, it, it could potentially cause damage. Uh, and these are a number of other earthquakes similar in magnitude. In fact, there, some of them are quite a bit bigger in magnitude and similar in distance. They've been recorded elsewhere in the region. And you can see this amazing difference over an order of magnitude in the accelerations between the Bondesi earthquakes that are felt in Australia and other similar earthquakes that are felt uh, along different paths. And we think this is you know, almost certainly due to the, the path effect that the, the lithosphere between the earthquake and Australia is just very efficient at transmitting seismic waves. So these earthquakes are important for Australians. But you don't see much in terms of felt reports in Indonesia. Some of this might be due, well, obviously, um, there's not much land area there, so there aren't, aren't big population centers, but there are some population centers, and, and people do have cell phone coverage and internet out there, and yet you don't see many felt reports, and there are no reports of damage throughout the 20th century, at least according to the uh, NOAA database, earthquake damage in the Banda Sea due to Banda Sea earthquakes. So it's really remarkable that, that they transmit this energy southward very efficiently. But what you see in the region itself, uh, it seems to be light shaking. In fact, uh, I wanted to point out, where is it? 
This one, it's 1938, was a huge earthquake, magnitude 8.6. It was about 60 kilometers depth, and it only produced sort of moderate shaking in the Banda Islands. So, um, you know, really, even a lot, these large earthquakes at considerable depth uh, don't produce much in the way of shaking in the Banda Islands, remarkably. Uh, let's move on. It was a different story for historical Banda Sea earthquakes. There are a number of earthquakes that occurred in the 17th to 19th centuries that we have historical accounts for, and they really caused a lot of damage in the Banda Islands. I mean, th these weren't just a few buildings destroyed. The, the descriptions are um, things like most houses became rubble heaps. 1710, most houses were damaged irreparably. 1760, three quarters of all houses were transformed to rubble. So clearly these were very damaging earthquakes and very different in character from the one that well, the ones that we've recorded from the 20th century onward. Um, these were often accompanied by ground cracking, fissuring, tsunamis, and prolonged sequences of felt aftershocks, none of which is typical of the interest lab earthquakes that, that we have been recording in the Banda Sea, all suggest uh, a nearby uh, shallow earthquake source. At least they suggest that to me. Now, um, on the other hand, uh, having a large earthquake and accompanied by a large tsunami in the Banda Sea, would it would be natural, natural for someone to ascribe this to the supposed mega thrust in the outer band Banda Island. Uh, it's a perfectly logical thing to do. Uh, it's subduction zones that generate the largest tsunamis. Uh, and this is a very large, this appears on, on the face of it, that there is a large subduction zone megathrust in the outer Banda arc. And so uh, in a couple of papers, Liu and Harris and Fisher and Harris, they studied two of the largest events, the 1629 uh, supposedly Serum Trough earthquake, and then the 1852 uh, uh, earthquake that supposedly occurred in the town of Bar Trough. So they, 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 um, they, based on the tectonics, based on the information available at the time, they inferred that these would have occurred on the megathrust and tried to determine what the magnitudes would have been and, and verify that they could uh, account for the observations. And you can see that, that the, the magnitudes they get are really big. The Serum Trough was uh, anywhere from 8.3 to 8.8, .8, and the Tannenbar Trough was somewhere around an 8.4. So very large earthquakes. Um, and this was inferred, at least for 1852, that's the one I'll mainly concentrate on because it has many more uh, observations. Um, and it was inferred, uh, or it was consistent at least, with what appeared to be a huge felt area. Um, this is, uh, here's the Banda Sea again. This is where the uh, location of the earthquake is inferred to have happened. And these are the intensity measurements. And you can see that it was felt as far away as Eastern Java which I think is about 2,000 kilometers, very far away. Um, and also, there were these islands that appeared in, uh, I think I've got that on here. There were, there were some small, uh, a small island that appeared over here in the Kai Islands. And this then was uh, uh, taken by Fisher and Harris to imply that the rupture area was in that area. Uh, they were aware that it might, it could have been co-seismic uplift because during these subductions and earthquakes, you do get uh, uplift and, and, it, and it, that can uh, cause islands to appear. But they were aware uh, and pointed out that there are also mud volcanoes in this region and the island could well have been associated with the eruption of a mud volcano. But in any case, they inferred that the rupture area must have been over here in the, in the very eastern part of the arc and that the felt area extended all the way through the Banda Sea and all the way over to eastern Java. So, you know, it did make, it made a lot of sense that it would have been a massive earthquake. Uh, they modeled the tsunami and that uh, major tsunami in Bandanera, as well as in uh, Ambon and, and these other islands uh, just south of Seram. And, um, and they were able to sort of adjust some parameters or consider a number of different cases. And that's where they came up with their magnitude 8.4 on the Seram trough. Oh, uh, sorry, on the Tannenbaum trough. Uh, let's see. Uh, and this is what uh, their tsunami waveforms look like. These were the, basically the three tsunami observations. This is the one in Bandanera itself. This was Ambon, and uh, let me, I should point out where those are. Uh, this is Bandanera. I pointed out that these are right here, just directly sort of opposite the town of Bar Trough. And then these other islands south of Serum, including Ambon and Saparua are over here. Uh, they, yeah, they're up here. And so that's where the tsunami observations were. These are the tsunamis they calculated. And so this is the Bondanera one. This is Ambon and Sapporo Bay. 
Uh, and they were, uh, to some extent, commensurate with observations. Certainly, Ambon and Saparua Bay were commensurate with the, the tsunami height, that is, was commensurate with what was observed. This was not true for the Bondanera observation, uh, which uh, at Bondanera, the tsunami observed was about eight meters in height. And so this is much smaller than that. Uh, so it does not represent that observation well. Also, another thing that that um, that we notice is that uh, these are all, and they have to do this. Uh, any uh, megathrust earthquake on that arc will have to produce a tsunami within the Banda Sea that arrives with this trough first. And you can see this negative trough appearing here. And you can see here, here's a an animation that was produced by Tony Pack a long time ago. And what happens is, uh, towards the inner part of the arc, you should get crest first, and then trough first will be directed outwards from the arc. So that's opposite to what we see here. Here we see that there's a, there are clear troughs in these tsunami waveforms. And the observations were that there was a surge, there was a sudden surge in water at all three places. The, the accounts were fairly clear that it started with a rise in seawater. So that is not consistent with the tsunami observations. Um, now, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, uh, so let's look at these observations one more time. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Harris, uh, Fisher and Harris were aware that this, this observation of the appearance of the island was uh, could likely be a mud volcano. This area is known for mud volcanoes. Here's a photo of mud volcanoes in this, in this same, uh, I don't know if it's exactly the same island, but it's very close to the same area. And you can see these, these mud deposits. It's interesting. This is a block of sandstone that's been sort of carried along. It's been lifted up and erupted with the mud, but all the rest of this is mud that's been erupted by the volcano. And, uh, and it's, it's well known. These occur, these type of mud volcanoes occur throughout this, uh, this part of the eastern Sunda arc, uh, as, but especially, particularly in the, in the, um, Kai Islands. And we know that these don't necessarily mean the appearance of these mud volcanoes, even when they're triggered by an earthquake, don't necessarily mean the earthquake was nearby. Um, this earthquake in September 2013 in the Makran subduction zone, this is, uh, you can see this is India, Pakistan, and Iran. So it's the very northern tip of the Arabian Sea, and there's what's called the Makran subduction zone. This was an inland earthquake. It was a magnitude 7.7 that occurred 350 kilometers inland uh, and it resulted, uh, even though it was that far inland, it resulted in the appearance of this island. This is before, this is after, and this new island has appeared. This is, uh, again, the eruption of a mud volcano. And in fact, these guys uh, uh, published a paper about this mud volcano. This has not only appeared during this earthquake, it happened during an earthquake in 1945. And in fact, uh, uh, this island has appeared four times since that earthquake in 1945. So it's a sort of regular occurrence. This mud volcano erupts and the island appears. And yet this earthquake uh, when it, that triggered this particular eruption was about 400 kilometers distance from the uh, mud volcano. So earthquakes can trigger these mud volcanoes at considerable distance. Just because the eruption was triggered doesn't mean the rupture was right near, near the volcano. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to point out that there's another mud volcano closer to home that occurred in eastern Java. So this is, uh, you can see here, this is not as far east as the Banda Sea. It's the eastern part of Java. Uh, it's called the Lucy Mud Volcano and was thought, at least by some people, to have uh, been triggered by the magnitude 6.3 Yogyakarta Carter earthquake 250 kilometers away. There was a paper some guys published in Nature that um, that suggested plot that this this earthquake could have plausibly triggered this uh, mud volcano, but this was highly controversial. This was a huge disaster. Uh, this mud is toxic. It uh, it's got filled with methane, and you know if you go to that to visit the site, you'll you'll smell. You know it really stinks with methane. It dislocated sixty thousand people and resulted in four billion dollars of economic loss. So uh, so assigning blame for this event was quite a, a political hot potato, and and in fact. Uh, there was, as it turns out, pure coincidence, there was a drilling, drilling that was taking place right exactly at this site. And, and, and there was a lot of um, discussion about whether, in fact, the earthquake could have triggered this, in which case the oil company would be off the hook, or whether the drilling triggered it, in which case, uh, yeah, there could be uh, some repercussions. Uh, and I think that the, the weight of scientific opinion is that it was a drilling accident and that the drilling uh, caused the eruption. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, you know, 
it, it, there is a plausible argument that possibly this earthquake could have triggered, even at that great distance, much smaller earthquake, 250 kilometers away. So, so we've now discounted the fact that the rupture, discounted the idea that the rupture area has to be over there on the outer bend arc just because this mold volcano is triggered. Then uh, the other uh, interesting uh, point uh, in a very recent paper, Marliani et al. have now decide, have now ascribed these historical accounts of earthquake shaking in eastern Java in 1852, not to the uh, uh, eastern Banda Sea earthquake, but rather to a local earthquake on a fault that they were studying. They were able to date rupture on that fault uh, on a fairly wide window that bracketed 1852. And they believe that these these uh, observations are actually associated with a local earthquake that occurred around the same time as this very large Banda Sea earthquake. So that means that um, that really we should only be looking at these felt observations when we want to constrain this earthquake. And that will result, as we'll see, in a much different picture for that earthquake. Um, and I wanted to point out uh, here that um, that really it is, it seems to me quite doubtful that uh, this large megathrust earthquake would have caused so much destruction in Bondon area. And this is a, a figure that Bill Fry from GNS New Zealand recently uh, showed the, the group and Adrian's uh, tsunami warning system group, uh, which showed uh, it's a, just a sort of schematic figure, an uh, 8.5 earthquake distance from the earthquake and the sort of felt intensity. And you can see once you get 100 kilometers away, even though these earthquakes are very large, once you're more than 100 kilometers away, you're really not getting very strong shaking. It's really going into light and just barely felt. So this is what, 250 kilometers. So it's right around here. So it's on the, the, the sort of lighter end of the light area. So it seems very unlikely to me that a mega, even a large megathrust earthquake that far away would have caused so much damage in bonding era. And we don't see that in, uh, in, in modern uh, megathrust earthquakes. You know, we've had very damaging earthquakes, 2011 Japan, 2004 Banda Aceh, but, but all that, by far the vast amount of fatalities and destruction in those cases was caused by the tsunami. There really isn't that much damage due to the earthquake shaking, even though they're, they're very large earthquakes, and that's due to the large distance. So it, it seems doubtful to me, just on the face of it, this the large megathrust earthquake would have resulted in that much damage in Bandanera at 250 kilometers uh, distance. But the real, um, the the much stronger argument for for this these earthquakes not to have been associated with the megathrust is. Uh, uh, based on geology and whether there is, in fact, a megathrust there. And here I've tried to compare. This is kind of a funny figure because I had to, I had to really shrink this one down. This is the Banda arc. It's the same as the previous figure. I had to really shrink it down to get the scales to match. But I tried to compare it with another. I tried to think of another subduction zone that has a nice arc like that. South Sandwich Trench looks similar. And my point, the point I want to make here is that the, the marine trench is right there where the the megathrust where the plate boundary crops out on the surface. That's where you get this dynamic topography developing uh, in the marine trench in a typical subduction zone. And you don't see that in the Banda Arc. Where the where the megathrust is the supposed megathrust is coming out on the surface, you don't get uh, a, a, there's a there's a shallow trough, but it's not very deep at all. The deep bathymetry in the Banda Arc is inboard of that uh, arc. In, the Weber Deep is here between what's called the inner and the outer arc. So here you'd get a, a very a very deep trough here rather than here, and that's so it's completely different from what you would see in a normal subduction zone. And so I would say that that um, this is reflecting a very different process, which which I know because I've talked to my co-author John Palmer, uh, and that that. Uh, uh, process is this. This in around 2010, Robert Hall and other people uh, came up with a, an alternative interpretation for the Banda Arc, the outer Banda Arc in particular. And what he realized, uh, mainly due to tectonic reconstructions and, and studying the geology in the area, but he also uh, got together with Glenn Spockman, a well-known uh, seismic tomography expert, to look at the shape of the slab beneath the Banda Sea. And he came up with this interpretation. And that is that as the, you have to be careful here because we're now looking south across the Banda Sea. And this was 15 million years ago. The Australian plate had this embayment in it. So there was this embayment where there was ocean lithosphere that extended, you know, on, on this sort of uh, indentation into the Australian 
uh, continental lithosphere. And so you did have subduction. The Australian plate was moving northward and the oceanic part of that plate was subducting. But, but as it finally started, uh, as the subduction uh, uh, proceeded and the slab rolled back into the Australian continent, uh, it stopped, of course, when it gets to continental lithosphere. But as, but, but as it got to this embayment, the, the slab rollback, the slab is just falling under its own weight. It can proceed and extend into this embayment. So you get the slab moving into this embayment, a single slab now, not, not two slabs. There is uh, some delamination and tearing here, but you result, this results in the geometry we see now, where rather than having two slabs subducting uh, northward and southward, what we have is a single slab that's just sort of sagged. It's rolled back and sagged down beneath the bond of sea like this. So very different process from what uh, what we would normally, what we would have in a normal subduction zone. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to uh, discuss why this is going to be so different. Why don't you have a megathrust there? I've, I've modified a quote from the, the, the movie that probably none of the younger people in the audience have seen, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, starring Humphrey Bogart. So if you want to know the origin of that quote, you'll have to watch that movie. Um, and uh, here on the left, I've shown a typical, I've just grabbed a figure from a paper by Curry et al. to show a typical megathrust. And you see the, this, this ocean plate is subducting, and it's been doing so for a long time. This would have displacements. This, the, here's the, um, the boundary between those two plates results in this huge fault, which is very mature because it's, it's experienced usually hundreds of kilometers of displacement over tens of millions of years. So, uh, and it, it might have uh, sediments that have been drawn down, or it might have erosive, it might be eroding the upper plate. So there's going to be a very, very mature fault zone here. Uh, it's also drawing down this, this, this is cold lithosphere. So it's drawing down the cold isotherms, uh, and it's developing a, a shear stress here. It will develop a shear stress on this fault. So these three things, the material properties and the stress state and the uh, thermal structure all result in, uh, they combine to uh, pr produce a, um, a uh, very wide area that has a consistent degree of frictional instability, right? And meaning that if rupture initiates somewhere along this wide seismogenic zone, it can propagate over a very wide distance, both a long strike and down dip. And that's what makes it so dangerous. It's this combination of, um, of the um, thermal material and stress states, thermal props, thermal structure, material properties and stress state that, that allow for this, this huge frictional instability to develop, develop on this continuous fault surface that extends over a very wide range. And that's why you get these huge earthquakes there. The bond arc, on the other hand, the outer bond arc looks like this. And what's happened is, um, this, there's been extension. This rollback has resulted in, in, uh, and a, a, a huge amount of extension and material has actually been extruded from the lower crust and, and, and potentially the upper mantle to sort of fill this gap left by the rolling back plate. And you do get at the end of that, you do get a fold and thrust belt, but the conditions along this, uh, what, what would be the mega thrust are likely to be very different from what we see here. This has all occurred. And this, this whole thing has opened up in 2 million years. So it's much younger. The, Australian continental crust is juxtaposed not with ocean lithosphere, but rather with this material that's been extruded from the lower crust and, and uppermost mantle. Uh, so the thermal structure and material properties are likely to be very different. And uh, so, so it's a completely different situation. And there's no real, there, there, there basically isn't a megathrust in the sense that we normally uh, uh, talk about a megathrust. So there's really no reason to, to believe that these huge earthquakes, the kind of huge earthquakes we get here, would also happen here. Um, and now, as it turns out, um, there's more to this story. Uh, John Pownell wrote this remarkable paper with co-authors Gordon Lister and uh, Robert Hall, uh, which summarized some of his observations in this area. And he, at some point, came to the realization that this whole thing, this whole Weber Deep, is one massive normal fault scarp. In fact, it's the largest uh, fault scarp exposed on the surface of the earth. And he saw he saw things like this. He's got photos like this that are just amazing uh, pictures of what is clearly a very fresh 
and very large normal fault scarp. This is actually on the eastern side of the Weber Deep, but there's there's a huge amount of extension. There's also these lineations at the base of the Weber Deep. It's very young and has very little sediment cover. As I said, it's opened um, a, a about 120 kilometers in um, in two million years. So that would that would that means there's about six centimeters per year of uh, extension that's being accommodated, and it's largely being accommodated here at the uh, bonded. That's what what it's now called the bonded detachment. A very very, very shallow dipping and very large normal fault, um, which, um, which, yeah, as I said, is, is quite a unique feature. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and so if we, that, if we now free ourselves of the notion that this earthquake must have been a large megathrust earthquake, and we just allow the restricted set of intensity observations, so now I've, 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 uh, 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 discarded the idea that the rupture area had to be near the outer arc, and I've discarded the intensity observations in eastern Java, and I've just used these observations in eastern Maluku to try to uh, fit the data. This is using an approach developed by Jonathan Griffin in a paper in 2018 that takes all of the uh, uh, macroseismic observations and tries to do a sort of grid search, a combination of a grid search and a Bayesian inference to determine uh, where and how big the earthquake responsible for those intensity observations was. And it, and it appears uh, that uh, the most likely location was very close to Bandanera with a magnitude that could have been as small as, uh, as uh, 7.5. So much smaller earthquake, much closer to Bandanera. And as I said, I think that uh, really matches the fact that we got this widespread destruction in Bandanera with all the felt aftershocks. It, it really suggested just the the... the um, the character of those accounts suggests to me that it was a, a much closer uh, and shallow earthquake. Uh, and so uh, if we then try to model that in somewhat more detail here, I put, I rather than, you know, this is looked at all possible earthquakes, and this is the area here of highest probability for the earthquake. I'm sorry, I didn't really explain these. This is the PDF, the probability distribution for the magnitude. It could have been bigger but could have been as small as 7.5. And so if we put an earthquake uh, 7.5 on the detachment near that sort of dark area where the high probability uh, the density was um, or high probability distribution was, um, we get, a, we get a, a fault plane that would look like that. And if we then calculate the ground motions and compare it to our observations, we get what's in the right-hand um, side of the figure here. This is a little bit complicated. What you see here is you have to plot the observations differently depending on whether they're interpreted in terms of the Tronenbach trough earthquake, which is the blue, or the bonded detachment, which is the, the uh, brownish color here. And then we did our own interpretations of the historical accounts, which were in some ways more uh, conservative than what Fisher and Harris did. So these circles and triangles represent exactly the same data, but in one case, the triangles are Fisher and Harris. So you can see we were much more conservative. We decided that it at, at, at MMI 8, uh, probably all of the buildings would have been destroyed. So we sort of capped our observations at MMI 8. Um, but in any case, you can see that, that our, our observations are much more consistent with the, um, with the nearby uh, earthquake on supposedly on the, the boundary detachment. You can see even if we plot their observations, their observations are also more consistent with the smaller earthquake much nearby than uh, than they are with the very large earthquake. It's just very difficult, even with all the uncertainties. There are lots of uncertainties here, both in the interpretation of the historical accounts, as well as, as in the calculated ground motions. We just use an intensity prediction equation from New Zealand because there is no intensity prediction equation that will match this particular tectonic setting. So we, we use that one because it was also subduction zone and it was an intensity equation. So there's lots of uncertainty in that as well. But I think really, there's just no way that you can get these high intensities uh, so far away. I think it really has to be a much closer earthquake and likely, well, and then you can get by with a, a much smaller earthquake. Um, so, so okay, so that ends this talk, the part about the ground motions. That all suggests that there is something that the ground motions were caused by an earthquake near to Bondanera. Sorry about that. It wasn't responding. Uh, okay, so now what about the tsunami? 
Uh, one of the most important observations of the tsunami is the timing of its arrival in Bandanera. It arrived about 15 minutes after shaking of five minute duration ceased. So that meant that it took about 20 minutes to get from the source of the earthquake to Bandanera. And what we've done here is plot the, what are called the inverse travel time contours. So we've started a tsunami in Bandanera and, and, and contoured the times at which it propagates outwards. So that means the candidates for the source of this tsunami are along this 20 minute contour. And here is where we did have a bit of discrepancy with Fisher and Harris, I'll point out that, you know, we would get from that Tanambar earthquake that the nearest, the first arriving tsunami would have taken, what, 25 minutes, 24, well, I think 30 minutes. And then, um, and then to get the, the peak in the tsunami, which would have to be generated over here, it would have taken about 40 minutes. We'll see that later, but, but that does not agree with their results. I don't know how they, frankly, how they could have got a timing that, that, that agreed with the observations. We find that the 20 minute contour, it, it crosses the bonded detachment well south of bonded area here. And then it also skirts this massive landslide scarp. There's this huge landslide scarp. There are several landslide scarps on the edge of the Weber Deep, but this one, this one really uh, takes the cake. This is, this is a huge uh, landslide scarp. You can see it here. It's about 50 kilometers wide by about 100, uh, over 100 to 150 kilometers long. Massive landslide scarp. Uh, and it, and it aligns very well. The toe of that aligns very well with the 20 minute contour. So that suggests two possibilities for the source of the tsunami. One would be an earthquake, which is sort of outside our main probability area, but farther south along the boundary detachment. The other would be this landslide. And then the third scenario we can consider is the one by Fisher and Harris uh, in the Tannenbar trough, the very large earthquake. And if we do that, we can do that. This is what we get. Now, these are, these are the different scenarios. This is the 8.4 on the Tannenbar trough, exactly what Fisher and Harris did. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's the Bonda detachment. So that's south of Bondanera along the Bonda detachment. A magnitude, we needed a magnitude 8.4. It's really the, we needed something big to try to produce those large tsunamis that we saw at Bondanera and elsewhere. So, you know, 8.4 was, was about as big as we could go at it reasonable depth on the detachment. Then there was a Tannenbar trough. This is exactly the Fisher and Harris scenario. And then finally, this was our, um, our slump on the Eastern side of the Weber deep, which we didn't, we didn't take the full, um, extent of that thing. I think we took about half the length and a quarter of, and a quarter of the width. So it was considered, we didn't assume that the whole, that whole landslide went in one go. We basically took about, about half or a quarter of it over here and allowed that to fail in a landslide. And so these are the um, the observations you get. Well, let me see. This shows the um, this shows the sea level displacement, which is the source of the tsunami, and this shows the maximum amplitude after doing the tsunami simulation. And then this shows the actual waveforms that were record, recorded at Bandanera, at Ambon, and at Saparua. And you can see that uh, it's really only the landslide that produces the observations. It's a really big, you know, eight meter tsunami. Uh, peak to peak in Bandanera uh, that, that was observed. Uh, the others really don't get that high, although the, um, the red one, which is, which is the, um, the bonded detachment earthquake gets, gets pretty big. The smallest one is the Tannenbar trough, and that's about similar height to what Fisher and Harris got. But you'll notice that the time is much later. The time, especially of this peak, is much later than what they calculated. I'm, not, I'm still not sure how they they got that result. But in any case, we find that only the landslide produces a tsunami big enough to match the accounts at Bondanera, and its timing is just about right. You can see that dashed line there. Uh, and I wanted to point out that these observations of the tsunami are, um, you know, are there based on historical accounts, but, but these are a little bit different. Typically, uh, historical accounts of tsunami are basically someone saw the tsunami and guessed, you know, it was a couple of meters high or it was 10 meters high. Sometimes they will say that the run up reached a particular building or a fort that might exist today. So that's a, that's quite a, that's a relatively precise observation, but requires you to actually model the run up, which can be very difficult. And the modeling can have a quite a bit of uncertainty. These particular observations were made on a ship that was anchored offshore. And these guys, as you can imagine, uh, anyone who's sailed a boat and, and, and anchored it, you're always very concerned about the ocean depth. And so they measure the ocean depth using what's what's called a plumb line, as indicated here. And, and, and as this tsunami was 
was taking place, you know, over over tens of minutes, they were measuring, you know, how deep they were concerned that their boat was going to hit the bottom and they were measuring the ocean depth. So these were actual measurements of the offshore height of the tsunami, which means they were quite good quality and uh, and were likely to be uh, reasonably precise. Also, they're consistent with eyewitness observations that said the channel between the two islands, there's the main island and then there's Lomthor that, um, you know, it almost emptied. There was just like a river. It was reduced to like a river running through it. And that would have to have to have been a very big tsunami, at least eight meters in height. So I think that that is quite a, a, a pretty solid observation. And the only thing we can do, we can make match that is a landslide on the other side of the Weber Deep, very large landslide. So how likely would it be that this earthquake would have triggered such a mass failure? Uh, it's pretty far away. I think it's about, uh, uh, it's about 250 kilometers, I think. And so um, you might indeed question, you know, you know could a, a magnitude 7.5 earthquake trigger a landslide 250 kilometers away? Well, who knows? Uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, there are a few, few systematic studies of this, uh, uh, but there was one done by the, in the U.S., uh, I think it was by Ten Brink, Uri Ten Brink, um, which looked at the possibility for a landslide, uh, 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 sorry, an earthquake, uh, on the U.S. mainland along the East Coast, but not submarine, to trigger a landslide offshore. And they found that indeed a 7.5 could uh, could definitely trigger failure at that distance if slopes exceeded six degrees. Now, this depends on the ground motion. It depends on the strength of the sediments. Uh, so there were a lot of parameters that we that might not be the same for this particular area, but that's the best we could do. And we tried to here con compare slopes, the maximum slopes observed, in these cross sections of the bathymetry of the Weber Deep. And you can see that they get pretty steep. The maximum slopes get up to like 7.9 degrees, 9 degrees, and 9.5 degrees, 6.6 .6 degrees. So they're definitely quite steep slopes on the edge of the Weber Deep. And uh, there are accumulations of sediment there. And so uh, it does seem possible, it seems plausible that these could have been triggered by a tsunami. It also seems quite plausible that they could simply occur spontaneously. Um, oh, and so what about the other events? I wanted to mention there, there were, this was not the only event that was destructive and caused a large tsunami. There were others uh, that, that did, did both of those things. And um, we believe that they could, have, they could be explained. There was one in particular, I think it was the 1763 in which the tsunami arrived much sooner. It was within just a few minutes of the earthquake and it arrived with opposite polarity. It wasn't a crest first, it was a trough first tsunami. And this could be explained by some of these other landslide scarps. There are ones on the western side. On the eastern side, you get the material that flows downhill so it'll push the water in front of it and result in a crest first tsunami at Bondonera. But these will actually pull the water down initially and would result in a trough first tsunami at Bondonera. So that same observation, which sounds very different in character, could be explained also by a triggered landslide on the western side of the Weber Deep. So it could well be that this has not only happened once in 1852, but happened during several of these events. Um, okay, this isn't the end of the story though. Oh, I better hurry up. Um, uh, so one of the reviewers wanted us to look at GPS data, which I was sort of afraid of because there's very little. We did a we did a lot of work with the Indonesians during the project that was funded by Australian aid and uh, helped them uh, make measurements and compiled all their old measurements to make uh, 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 the most extensive set of GPS measurements that, that has ever been assembled for this Eastern Indonesia. And, uh, and you can see that out in the Banda Sea, there are just very few measurements still, right? So we did what we, we, we took those. There were a few more that were made and, um, and uh, we, we, we had to see what we could do with that. So what we expected to see, of course, was that as this rollback, the slab rollback occurs, there will be um, either extension or eastward movement of the Banda plate, you know, in this east-west direction. It should be either being torn apart or it should just be moving towards the east. That's what initially we expected to see. And, and that made a lot of sense in terms of what, you know, there, there's modeling, numerical modeling of this phenomenon. And that's certainly what it shows. And we didn't see that. This is a very complicated figure. Xu Yuan was doing, he was doing this work. Um, you know, he sort of had this model all set up and I was able to get a few more recent observations from my colleague, 
Irwin Meilano at ITB, and we could do a little bit better job. But you can see this is the bond of plate. This is the what's called the tectonic plate model. So we model, we put all these different plates into the model and allow their boundaries to deform due to due to the um, you know due to them rubbing against each, against each other. But the problem was in the bond of plate. The most important one, we really only have four observations, and two of them are very close to the fault we want to study, meaning that they'll be they'll be influenced by any, any interseismic deformation associated with that fault. And the only procedure we could come up with in the end was to discard these observations initially, do our tectonic block model to get the motions of all these tectonic blocks. And that meant the bond of plate was only constrained by these two observations. And then we took the motion of that block. And we subtracted it from the observations. So let me see the, the observed are these green arrows, the modeled are the yellow, right? So we subtracted these yellow from the green and obtained these residuals. And those residuals do point right in the direction of the bondage attachment. And they are, they are very close to what you would expect for, for pure normal, uh, for locking of a purely normal thrust. So that was, that was encouraging. Uh, but I do have to admit that it's, it's actually not. This would be purely normal. This is consistent. So this, these are the observations here. If you get the residuals, they're pointing this way, right up dip along the bondage attachment, as you ex expect for a locked purely normal fault. However, the opening of the bond to C is actually more in this direction. So it really should be an oblique normal. So it doesn't actually, it doesn't exactly match what we'd hope, but it was a story that allowed us to say that the GPS measurements seem can, consistent with locking of a large normal fault near near the Banda Islands. And this is sort of the, another picture we get. This is an idealized cross section that cuts through the Banda Islands here. And then, then I plotted both the outer arc uh, observations to the north and south on the same cross section. So this is what you get. The Weber Deep is formed by this uh, upper mantle, lower crust exhumation here. There's the fold and thrust belt, which is consistent with the observations made at um, at um, the vertical uh, movement at this outer arc uh, could be consistent with small thrust faults in that folding thrust belt. And then in the Banda Islands, you can see that both the horizontal and vertical components are consistent with a locked normal fault here. So, um, so that was a nice story, but I, we couldn't, this is actually a very interesting study in itself, but there's so few data to constrain it that we really, we really couldn't make that much of it. You know, it's a really nice story, but um, but we just couldn't. We, there's not that much we could we could say about it, uh, given that the observations were so few. What I did want to point out was what we didn't see was eastward movement or or uh, uh, extension of this bond of plate. And so the the interpretation that I it might be a naive interpretation, but you know the interpretation I think about is that it what's happening is this bond of plate is trapped. What you're getting is the Australian plate is moving northward, and this is trapped between the Australian plate and the Philippine sea plate, so it can't move eastward. Even though, you know, that, that rollback is trying to suck things toward the east, this can't move, and perhaps that's actually why the Weber Deep is open. Uh, it's a hypothesis that would be very interesting to test with further observations there. I wanted to, but I have, I'm almost done. Uh, this is second to last slide. Uh, there, the story still isn't over because, you know, we, we're saying that this would very large earthquake there occurred on a low angle normal fault. And these are very controversial. So controversial, they have their own acronym, LANF. They've been studied uh, fairly extensively. And um, the problem is they are low angle and normal faults shouldn't be active at such low angles. Uh, there, it's an unfavorable orientation. Uh, and that should basically, as the normal fault gets gets shallower and shallower, it should lock up. And so this has been uh, quite controversial. Uh, we've seen this elsewhere where it looks like they're active, but pe fault mechanic people say there's no way it can be active. Uh, there are, we do know that some of these have ruptured in earthquakes as large as 6.8 on with dips as low as 20 degrees. That was in New Guinea. Uh, uh, but, but we do have, uh, I do have a bit of an out here because um, this guy, uh, Weber et al., were studying this uh, low angle normal fault in New Guinea, and they were showing how what can happen is, even though you get this, new, this very low angle normal fault, what will happen is rupture will shift to a more steeply dipping uh, normal fault that, that's sort of outboard of the low angle 
fault. And and that could be happening in the web or deep in, in near Bondonera. We just we have not seen, maybe no one has mapped that fault, and there is a fault like that that caused the rupture of the seven, magnitude 7.5 earthquake and resulted in triggering the tsunami. Okay, so let me get to the conclusions. Um, the, there are these the destructive historical earthquakes in the Banda Sea were likely caused by the earthquakes associated with the Banda detachment. It is unlikely that the giant megathrust earthquakes occur on the outer megathrust because, as John uh, Powell uh, says, there is no megathrust there. The destructive tsunamis we think were like most likely generated by submarine mass failure on the edge of the Weber Deep, and these were at least the historical ones were triggered by earthquakes, but potentially that could occur spontaneously. You could get spontaneous mass failure, even without the, at least potentially, without the occurrence of the earthquake, which is a, a important point for tsunami hazard. And then finally, this is a much more speculative point, but uh, but I put this in that the Bonda plate resists accommodation of the extension associated with slab rollback because it's sort of pinned between the Australian and Philippine plates. And that's my question. Could this be why we get formation of the Weber Deep and we don't simply get a breakup of the bond of play. Um, okay, that's that's uh, the end. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry I took so long. Great, thanks, Phil, for uh, for an engaging <laughs> talk. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and, and there's no one's posted any questions. But um, are you able to sort of speak what the implications of this work are in terms of the the earthquake and tsunami hazard? in the area uh, are you able to speculate given that there's so few observations yeah is it is it likely to have a similar event any time in the, in the near future i mean can you are you able, do you want are you feel comfortable to speculate around that well yeah i think that you know in the past um most of the earthquake and tsunami hazard has been associated with that supposed bond of megathrust and i think that we have to uh, accept that the, the story is much more complicated than that uh, hopefully this establishes that um, we're not going to have these huge megathrust earthquakes, especially on that southern uh, rim, the Tanambar Trough, because that could potentially threaten Australia. Um, but certainly you can get these very large earthquakes, very, these quite large earthquakes still, uh, much closer to Bondanir, much closer to some of those population centers in eastern Maluku. And um, the tsunami hazard... Um, if this is correct, if this work is correct, the tsunami hazard associated with submarine landslides there is significant. And that also poses a, a trouble uh, for uh, tsunami hazards and in particular tsunami warning system. Much, much more difficult to warn for this. Yeah, certainly as, we're, as we've seen uh, in the Palu um, situation yeah, as well. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks very much, Phil. Um, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, so that just wraps up today's uh, Wednesday seminar. Next on the next seminar is on Wednesday, the 5th of August, where we have Dr. Laurent Alarez from Monash University uh, presenting Loop, the next generation integrated and interoperable platform enabling 3D statistic geological modeling. Goodness, that's a mouthful. Sounds pretty interesting. All right, so um, thank you everyone. Uh, please join us then. Uh, now we're signing off. Thank you. <laughs>